Oh, we know ZTE can deliver some stunning hardware. Taken the wraps off the Axon 40 Ultra. This is a brand I've had fond experiences with since the glory days of the Axon 7. The Axon 40 Ultra arrives as a top technology platform phone, but it's also looking to undercut prices of similarly labeled premium tier Ultra phones. I've been testing the starter version of the Axon. This is the eight gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigs of storage model, which will start at $799. Doubling the storage and adding 50% more RAM will only cost another $100. It's another device this year aiming squarely at the tier of phones between an iPhone 13 non-pro to somewhere around a Galaxy S22 Plus, but with some hardware aiming to compete higher up the food chain. <laughs> Seriously, the spec sheet is jam-packed with all the numbers we say we care about, and a few tech tricks that I think enthusiasts will probably appreciate. Now, the overall build, the hardware, this design is recognizable, but it still feels a little fresh. Curves of glass that create an almost perfect oblong cylinder, and the nearly sharp corners that you might see on a Note 22. And I really like this back material design. It reminds me of the textured look, but matte feel of phones like the Vivo X80. There's a big block of cameras on the back, more on those in just a bit. It looks the part of an Ultra. It feels really nice in the hand. Nah, I'm not gonna do that. Moving to the front, we see some interesting choices being made. The screen is a nice, pretty OLED. It's respectably bright outdoors, and with the mandatory high refresh, the HDR 10s, the resolution is full HD+, plus. not just plus some vertical resolution, also plus 30 pixels across. We might be accustomed to Quad HD, or maybe even UHD on the premium end of the phone market, but the Axon does have one nifty trick I appreciate. Do you notice anything different there? Maybe a lack? of holes or notches or disruptions to the screen. I gotta get my camera to focus back on me. No, ZTE is well ahead of the curve on hiding the selfie camera under the display, and it's just so nice to see an unbroken screen. Similarly, the fingerprint sensor is a good optical performer. It's also under the screen. I'm not the biggest fan of in-display sensors. This one works fine, but I'd much prefer a power button fingerprint sensor or a nicer ultrasonic under display sensor. Also, probably something that comes maybe a bit from the Red Magic, the speakers are nicely balanced. I like that they match between the top and bottom if you're listening sideways, left channel, right channel. We've got a pretty nice full listening experience here. <laughs> And the haptics. The haptics are fun. You know, the motor has a subtle but distinct pop while typing, and it's used to nice effect throughout the phone. There's a harder click when you're adjusting the volume. I don't think this is the most powerful motor, but I greatly prefer better articulation on a haptic motor. And the Axon can detail different buzz and pop feels to line up with your ringtones. It's almost like the dynamic subwoofer feel on an Xperia. Okay, moving right along, performance is a big claim for ZTE. It's been a challenge this year to show. I mean, it seems we need a little additional hardware to help with thermals, which ZTE was happy to show off in their press slides. I don't believe we can much trust benchmark scores for comparing phones these days. We've seen a few too many manufacturers game their benchmarks. For my real world testing, where I time the completion of tasks like video rendering, batch photo processing, and podcast audio mixing, the Axon's showing some promising results. Let's be frank, this is one of the slowest premium phones of the year to finish a video render in PowerDirector, but it's right in line with the fastest phones of the year if you cut in KineMaster. So if you're going to do some work with these really big cameras on the back and you wanna edit the output on the go, you'd probably wanna know which app runs better on the phone, something you can't glean from a synthetic benchmark score. The Axon 
does not win races for the podcast mixdown or photo processing, but it's in the mix with a healthy collection of finishing times. We're not at the highest end of the price bracket, and we're also not at the highest end of the performance tier, but we're still delivering laptop competitive results, and the phone is still in the league of ridiculous overkill for compute power if you're just looking at the average consumer daily driver tasks. It's way too powerful for that. I mean, we have to get into the really high level stuff to show where a more expensive competitor might outpace it. That sideline conversation, performance, which might go hand in hand with software, the Axon is well behaved. And it takes a lot to get the phone running hot. So there might be a bit more aggressive curve on performance management, preserving battery life and delivering very good performance instead of just letting the SOC run wild, run as hot as it can go. The My OS skin is bouncy and playful. Pieces are where you would expect them to be on a modern Android phone, but the animations feel fresh. They feel unique. How the notification shade transitions, how multitasking snaps into place. The phone feels fast throughout the UI. It really is satisfying to thumb through, even in such an early state. This was pre-release software for me, and happily the Axon is also delivering one of the best versions of the Android desktop mode. We plug the phone in, we get that super stark desktop view with a tiny little app drawer. This is not nearly as functional as Moto Ready 4, LG Screen Plus, the Honor Magic desktop mode or Samsung DeX, but it's still handy when you wanna work from your phone and you want a full screen space on a TV or on a monitor you know, to multitask with an app or two at the same time. Definitely a little too basic for the power users out there, but absolutely nice in a pinch to be able to put down more of this compute power and really use it for some proper work. Similarly, fast performance on the desktop mode as we see directly on the phone and without the visual glitches or instability we saw on the OnePlus 10. Okay, I've been dancing all around it. You know, I've been in camera mode on a number of my phone videos lately, and we should probably talk about these cameras here, because boy howdy, this one really kept me on my toes. A little behind the scenes part of this conversation, just to understand where I'm at. When I first got the phone, it was a mess. The camera app was constantly crashing and there was a really nasty bug on the zoom. You would try to switch to the zoom sensor while shooting video, immediately knock you out of the camera app. But ZTE has aggressively pushed out a trio of patches before the embargo. That's great, but it's also made my testing significantly more difficult. Just as I thought I would get a handle with some samples, I'd get an update, and it would actually improve camera performance. You get that feeling like I really need to go out and reshoot the stuff I've already shot. I kind of don't always have the time to fully reshoot everything. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. The camera has been wonderfully improved over the pre-release cycle, but it has been a tricky moving target to pin down. But I digress, that's enough BTS. This is a feature packed camera. I refuse to call this a review. My use on this phone has been pre-release. We're nowhere near the final word on this phone. I think it would be a really bad look for people out there to say, oh, this is a review of the Axon. Because I hope to see a little more polish. Again, we can't fault ZTE for the hardware. We do need to kind of see what they might be able to do with the software. So much of what makes an Axon interesting is this almost brute force approach to hardware. A trio of 64 megapixel cameras, but the main sensor and the ultra wide are both in the top tier for sensor size. A beautiful Sony 1 over 1.3 inch sensor bends down to 16 megapixel stills, and the sensor on the telephoto is a very large half inch on a periscope folded lens. I'm not just blowing smoke here, acting like, oh, I'm so impressed with this hardware. I've begged for this in the past. This trio of cameras is about as close as we've ever gotten to my personal unicorn camera phone. What holds this hardware back a bit is a dense camera app that I think slows the user down. Almost everything you might want is here. I'm not gonna read off this list of modes, that's insane. Where I feel the standard auto shots are a little too bright, a little too vivid, 
The manual modes are nicely complete, and the raw files are brilliant to edit. And the video, oh, the video. All three sensors can natively shoot up to 4K at 120 frames per second. This is only the third manufacturer to put out a phone that can natively handle this resolution and frame rate. And only the Sony, the Xperia 1 Mark IV, can also match that on all three sensors. I've seen this in my comments a little bit, felt like I should just reply. You can force a 4K 120 frame per second camera mode with a third party app. Sometimes Filmic will let you do it, but it's a very different situation when the manufacturer has enough confidence in their product to include it in their camera app natively. Now, just a little curious, at the time this video was shot, 8K video had been removed from the Axon 40 Ultra. As we got these pre-release review units, we had an option for 8K that seems to be gone now. I'm not bothered. I'm not the biggest fan of 8K video from a phone. 4K 120 is the way. And as you would imagine from sensors this large, low light performance is very good. It's often excellent if we can see more internal lens reflections than I'd maybe want. But at this price and given the rest of the performance, lens coatings aren't the worst compromise to make. You just will see a couple little dots of light reflected back at you in night scenes. My main issues aren't as much with the output of photos and videos, but on the navigation and conveyance. So many modes and the mode slider ticks you by slowly one mode at a time. That drives me nuts that I can't smooth scroll through the list. You have to customize this list just so you can always tap to get to the modes you use the most. And with such a crazy list of options, not all of them are well explained. After playing with the vlog mode, I got it, but I had to take some time to get there. It's Kind of just a fancy editing mode for quick short clips. The electronic mode. Drop a comment down below on what you think electronic mode does. But when we're in a mode, the shutter is nice and snappy. None of the lag that you might see on a Samsung for the similar kind of image processing that they're aiming for. But navigating the app is definitely pokey. And maybe my biggest user gripe, there is no hardware quick launch. ZTE, please, if you're listening, I'm begging you. Give us a shortcut like double tapping the power button to launch the camera. I hate swiping the screen with the burning passion of a thousand suns. When I want to get a shot of my daughter in action, I need the camera on screen before the phone is up to my eye. Anything slower than that or requiring you know, more visual and tactile attention, I'll swipe up the screen. That means I've already missed a shot. She's gone. She's six, she's a Tasmanian devil. I need to be able to keep up. And because I pointed it out while we were talking about the phone design, we should probably share a few brief comments on the under display selfie camera. It's soft. Yeah, it's really soft. The tech is exciting for people like me, people who play games and stream content. I hate it when something is cutting up my screen, especially something like a webcam. If you've been following my channel at all, I've been making this joke for years because I hate selfie cameras. Arg. Why would you want to take photos of your precious moments with the worst camera on your phone? I mean, when you compare the output on the Axon, it really drives that point home. If you can get even just a little comfortable with a rear camera selfie, you'll never use your front camera for stills or video unless you absolutely need to. This camera is plenty fine for a video call. And that's really all I ever use my selfie cameras for. I just need to leave off this section reminding people this rear hardware is excellent. It really is easy getting stunning content out of this phone. Moving on, the network performance has been solid. Band support for T-Mobile seems to work well-ish in my neighborhood. But as I'm currently on Mint, sometimes it's tricky to tell if it's poor coverage or if I'm getting throttled during network congestion. Regardless, in my very limited testing and comparing, I'd say we're just behind the radio performance of Samsung and OnePlus under 
similar conditions. Wi-Fi has been spot on. Handles my Wi-Fi 6 router great, easily maxes out what my cable company can send. And lastly, battery life has been very good for these early weeks. Again, we should not deliver any info on this phone as if it's the final word on the product. I've personally seen firsthand how different the Axon has performed after some relatively small OTA updates. It's not been a challenge to make it past dinner time with a healthy mix of services, some light gaming, jumping on and off 5G and Wi-Fi, I still haven't found anything that beats my LG V60 in terms of outright heavy use screen on time. So in the ballpark of phones launched this year, I'd say this is very good. Again, your mileage may vary depending on what heavy use looks like for you. But what's nice though is getting another option with a 65 watt fast charger in the box. This is such a huge lifestyle feature for Samsung and Apple to be sleeping on. It's a critical advantage for a Red Magic or an Axon. It matters a little less if you're running low on battery when topping the phone off for five minutes can probably get you through almost a day of use. You want real fast charging in a phone. The Axon has real fast charging. And that's about where we should probably wrap up this first look. The Axon 40 Ultra is a beautiful work in progress. This is a hardware-centric, price-competitive shot at the larger brand's premium-tier phones. And it wins some significant victories against phones that cost $1 to $200 more. But what remains to be seen is how the update and patching process is going to be handled. And I don't think it's too bold a prediction that when a phone launches with this kind of hardware, at a price this low, software support might not be the most aggressive focus. I think that's a fair comparison point for the informed buyer today. ZTE is not a casual brand to shop. Oops, I accidentally dropped $800 and got this phone. That doesn't happen. So I have to believe there's a target consumer out there who is looking this up and considering it and probably understands the pros and cons. I mean, given how fantastic the pre-release patching has been, I mean, we can see the improvements. We can see ZTE is capable of pushing out some really good software. But really, ZTE, you have to give me a power button camera shortcut. Killing me, ZTE. You're killing me. But I digress again. I will, of course, leave some links down below where you can find more information on the ZTE Axon 40 Ultra. Maybe shop one of these bad boys online. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been absolutely amazing. Those of you who are checking out the links down below, maybe hitting my website, somegadgetguy.com, or those of you who have joined the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the galaxy. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at somegadgetguy on the Twitters and the Twitch. Not so much on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, but I will catch you all on the next video.